in the Sustainable Development Goals, we are saying we should leave no one behind and start with the fathers first. Innovation is a key part of um, the recovery process. We set up the first assistive tech accelerator in Africa uh, to support innovators who are building technology to support persons living with disability. Anybody who is interested in trying a person with disability in employment, contact us. We work like thrice as hard. We have to remember that is 15% of the population that's being left out if your products and services are not accessible. My name is Tony Domo. I am Kitabu's founder and CEO. The company is eight years old and the goal of Kitabu has always been to deliver digital solutions to the education system in Kenya. So that means a lot of things for a lot of people. Uh, if you're a student, that's you know, digital content, uh, an alternative to learning patterns, and an online learning platform. If you're a teacher, same thing, digital content for teachers, because content is expensive, uh, but also a, a tool that you can use to, whether it's create content for students, or engage students digitally, or do tutoring online. And if you're a school, the usual things, a school information management system. So those things are really helpful, specifically for institutions that are trying to um, lower their costs, increase accessibility, but also be relevant in the future of work where 45% you know, of the jobs that will be in 2050 plus are essentially not there now. So it's trying to, to, to build a world that you've never been in. And technology is the only way to do it. It's not an addition, it's, it's the must-have now. So that's what Kitabu does. So I'm dyslexic, and, and dyslexia, unlike uh, a physical disability like being blind or being deaf or, or mute, is, is, a, is a way of design where reading, learning, in, in the context of our 844 system is downright impossible. Um, words don't look the same to me as they look to normal people. I cannot follow a sentence, paragraphs, it's very difficult. So going, growing up uh, in the Kenyan education system, was very difficult. I was always the last in the class who go at the back, chilling. You know, teachers are telling you, I was always that kid. But that doesn't mean I wasn't smart. Dyslexia is a condition that uh, impairs somebody from reading, writing, and spelling. And sometimes they have uh, processing. Information processing is slow. As I got older, I got to understand that there's different ways in which we learn. And it's, it's really important for us to appreciate the kind of children we have because they're not all like, you know, industrial, you don't put us on a conveyor belt called school and then we come out the same. So it's, it's being able to craft that learning system around the student instead of crafting you know, the student around the learning system. And that was my inspiration for Kitabu. Let's build a system that is built around the student instead of the student built around the system. So Kitabu is, is, is four products. We have a SIMS or a school management system. It's a platform that collects data and then translates this data in decision making. And that's where the AI, artificial intelligence, ML, machine learning tools come into play. The second thing Kitabu is, it's a learning management system. A learning management system basically is a mobile application tied to a back-end system where you put content and somebody can be able to consume this content. Very much like YouTube or Vimeo or anything like that. And then the third thing that Kitabu is, is a, is a game platform, it's a gaming tool. So we've built Kitabu so that children who specifically are much younger, ECD, you know, you know, two to five or six, can be able to interact with a gaming experience that educates them as they go. So how do we distribute this? Well, the school management system goes to schools. That comes with an app for teachers and for, for students. And then the teacher and the students get those apps on their smartphones, mobile devices, whether they're at home or in school, that's up to them. And we push content through the school to the teachers and the students. So we have created 4,500 videos. These are small six, uh, two to six minute videos. 
about you know verbs, nouns, algebra, all of these things based on the Kenyan education curriculum, funded by MasterCard Foundation. Thank you very much, MasterCard. And um, this content is what we push out on our platforms so that teachers can use them to educate children, but also they can give them to the kids for the kids to learn. And all of that data is stored on Kitabu Super School. The teacher's app is called Kibanda, and the student's app is called Somanasi. And then there's Kijiji, and Kijiji is a first-person gaming experience for kids to be able to learn how to be safe online, which is supported by UNICEF, and, and we're looking forward to pushing that out into the country in the course of the year. But th those are the tools that we use, and, and they're simple tools. They're not complicated tools, um, and they're built for mobile, Africa-centric markets. So usually school management systems are complex, and you need to have a techie in your school. Mm -mm. Ours are simple. You deploy it in your school, pull out a mobile device, and then how many children came to class? Plip. What are you learning today? Plip. What do you need? Plip. And the mobile app does all the work for you. And that's how we've built this. So we are on 370 something thousand users. Um, we just signed an MOU with Capture, which is the Kenya Primary School Head Teachers Association, to do school management system for 26,000, 27,000 schools, which we're going to be providing for them for the over the next two and a half years. Uh, Amazon Web Services is now supporting us to do that, so all their schools will be on um, locally hosted but Amazon cloud servers. Schools have never had this before. Uh, headmasters are going to have a mobile app, teachers are going to have a mobile app, which feeds information into the school management system. And then the school management system can recommend learning tools, um, meeting areas, integration with Zoom and Microsoft Teams, and all of that comes together. And essentially, with minimal effort, we're taking as many schools as possible or available in Kenya and elevating them into what we call digitally ready schools. We feel like teachers are the ones who are left behind the most, but they're the ones who benefit the most. So it's not even the student, it's the teacher who benefits the most. It reduces the workload, it allows them to be able to standardize how they teach, but also it gives them room to be creative about how they deliver their content, all from their mobile phone. So, so we are very excited to have 18,000 headmasters on our platform, we're very excited to have uh, now what is close to 700 schools, which is going to become 5,000 schools by the end of this year. And then by the end of uh, 2022, we're looking at 27,000 schools. So it's really exciting to see all these things happening. And, uh, and it's intriguing because it's Kenya. If you want to do tech, do it in Kenya. People are ready. They understand the need and they have seen uh, the benefits. We understand and note that uh, we have a, a whole special needs uh, education team. Uh, led by Sylvia Muturi. And what we know is data is the biggest challenge. Because people don't know how many we have. One in 16 people in Kenya has a disability. One in 16. That's a lot of people. That's a very large number of people. And we know that if we don't have this data harnessed, if we cannot then identify, understand, and consume these communities of folk into our society, we're losing out one in 16th of everything. And that's a lot. So is there a way we can do that? So the first thing we did was deploy our super school management system in their schools, collect data about them, their families, their state of being, do you actually have a loved one taking care of you or not? And once we understand that, it allows us to link them with parties in country and around the world who have an interest in, in lifting them up. And th that flow of resources that is direct, it doesn't pass through any middlemen, it's, it's, it's more impactful because you have now more bang for your buck, as they would say. And, and that allows these children to have a more secure future. It allows these institutions to run above board. It allows transparency. And it also allows clarity. You have a clarity of purpose, a clarity of partnership. And I think most importantly, a clarity of outcome. We know what we are working towards. And that then allows everybody involved to be really sold into the plan. And so that's the first thing we've done. We've provided school management systems for this um, institutions, we've made sure we're mapping all the students and the challenges they're having, and then we're giving this information, of course using the Data Protection Act so we're not, you know, messing up with privacy, but we're providing the needs, we call it a needs assessment, to partners who have an interest in whether it's children with visual um, impairment or listening impairment or speaking impairment or cerebral palsy or mental health issues, whatever it is they have, we're giving this information to them and allowing them to be like, we're going to budget for X and Y and Z, Thika in uh, Western and Coast, and that money gets funneled directly and does a better job than just throwing money in the air hoping to hit someone. Step five, build with evidence. Evidence makes a difference. The best evidence includes field trips to see the program in action.
We've got all sorts of models, right? We can partner with publishers on content we feel we like, or we can partner with authors directly, or we partner with teachers directly. We've done all three of them. And, and it's primarily because these are professionals in their own area, and there's no single path to content. The Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development has made it very open, the content that is required. And because these teachers teach this content, and then they even create their own storylines based on their students, they are masters of this craft. So we respect them and we approach them and say, give us help in this area. Publishers are also very open to it. Post-COVID, there's no publisher who's not understanding the power of EdTech now. And so we've had very good reception and very good partnerships and collaborations with a lot of publishers on content. And we're taking our time in converting that content into, you know, whether it's animations or you know, videos that have you know, green screen background so we can animate that or add video to it or it's text for bra braille which is something we're working on that's very difficult to learn about it uh, but also getting translators so there's different ways in which we can deliver this content just nobody has ever targeted special needs education and we want to be the first to do that and we are the first to do that but also in addition to that the platforms going into these schools and being like we are bringing technology to you at no cost to you that's huge for them because they, they have Excel sheets from 1992. This is how they know that data is like, you're like, no, 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 it's okay. We will take care of that. And because this, this data matters. And so let's aggregate it. And let's be able to build trends. And, and let's be able to map the process or the progress of SME in Kenya. And then get people who are interested in these markets to, to invest. Yeah, but the reason why we feel like uh, we should go in that direction is, is because it's necessary. It's not just just. It's not just the right thing to do. It's necessary because technology has always been good at um, addressing people who are in are within it. We talked about uh, not a long time ago how the web is white. When you Google good hair, it's usually a Caucasian man or woman. Uh, when you Google ba bad hair, it's usually a, a black person, right? <laughs> Dreads and, and all of that. Why? Because the algorithms were not created by people who look like you are. And so that's, we don't want to do that with education. We don't want to craft it for able-bodied individuals only. We need to be able to include everyone. And as a community of people, a billion plus of us who have been excluded so, so much for so long, it's, it's on us understanding what it's like to not be part of the core group, to build for other people who don't feel like they are the core group. And special needs is a definite you know, core group that nobody's paying attention to. And we all must pay attention to them because they are our brothers and sisters. They are our people. Hey. <laughs> a lot of innovation is, is done for two reasons. It's done because somebody's passionate about a problem or there's money in it. And there's not a lot of people from the disabled community who have been involved in technology development. So you're not gonna, you usually build for yourself. You're not gonna build for people you don't understand. And there are not many people who are in the disability or special needs category who are building tools for their community. So the second incentive is, is capital, money. Can we make money? And, and there they, they just doesn't seem to be enough capital in the special needs area for somebody to build something for them. For many years, when we talk about disability, we talk about it from a very um, grant-based um, model, which is, you know, can you help us, can you give us a grant, can you, you know, it's very um, non-scalable. Can we make this problem um, a bit of a business problem as well? Because I think money moves countries and it moves governments, and I think this is an area that is really, really needed. Um, and I think we were talking about the cost of assistive technology. So if we create enough of a demand for the product in the market, then it could push the price down and it could also influence policy and regulation around assistive technology in different sectors. So for us, you know, we don't have enough information on sexual reproductive health or GBV. There is no accessible format of information out there for us. So we've been going to deaf schools and also talking to the deaf youth so that they can be able to overcome those challenges of accessing the information. And that is how Kitabu comes in. So we are a linguistic minority. Our main means of communication is sign language. 
which many people in the hearing society don't know, including within the school system, in the learning institution, the children miss that information. Some people assume that when you go to a school for the deaf, the deaf children will get everything, which is not the case. You cannot compare a deaf child with a hearing child in a learning setting. A hearing child will hear the information everywhere, on the streets, on the TV, the radio, social media, on their phones, from friends, when they talk out there. But for a deaf child, the world is very, very, very silent. So if you're not informing the deaf child through sign language, they're not aware. And also you need to make sure that you give it in a way that a deaf child is able to understand. We interacted with the CEO, Tony. Like I said, we need to come up with accessible formats, which is need to be deaf friendly, because written format is not deaf friendly to us. It doesn't benefit us. They need visual, like videos, that's deaf friendly, pictures, short words or somebody signing that can benefit them, they can grasp the information. Books that are just visual representation, just pictorials. So you can draw the body and then you can explain this is this, this is the other, so that they can understand. So these are acceptable formats. So this platform, we have seen that, yes, Kitabu has the capacity, the technical skill to do that. And now that's why we linked up with them, so that there's the dissemination through this uh, product called Super School within the deaf schools, so that it's more accessible. Because what is amazing to me is uh, when I met Tony, he's never really interacted with a deaf person, but I saw that he really has a heart for the deaf community because um, I've met with many people, but they're like skeptical about us. But with Tony, I saw that, yes, he does have a heart of people with special needs. He doesn't want us to be excluded. And we are happy that he has included FedWim as an organization to partner with us so that we are able to do this together to create an impact because we'll be the first people to do this in the country, having sexual reproductive health information for the learners. Uh, and adolescents within the deaf schools. And I hope that uh, the government of Kenya and the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health, if you can listen to me, I hope you please embrace this, what we are doing, so that we can all collaborate together so that no one is left out. Because currently our children are being left out and we don't want this to continue happening. We want them to be part of the community of education and of the institution, of the learning institution. The UNDP came in the right time. So them coming out to us and saying, hey, we're going to give you some money to try this thing out was really brazen of them. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. And it allowed us to, to start this thing we had in our pockets that we never really started until they came to it. Here's a big check. Do your thing. And so, yeah, so that's made us very happy. We're very comfortable having them on board. Um, we like that they open doors. They are well-networked, very influential, well-resourced and uh, Kitabo has been able to move forward with our program. Not just for one school, for 10 schools, and we're hoping to push it to four other countries. When COVID uh, first uh, hit, we uh, came up with a COVID response offer, what we call prepare, respond, and recover. Uh, and this was very early in the advent of, of the pandemic. And from six months of implementation of our prepare, respond, and recover, which looked at issues of understanding the socio-economic impact of the pandemic to addressing issues around uh, resilience of health systems to addressing um, issues around uh, coordination at national and sub-national level um, to direct development of the socio-economic response plans that I've uh, just mentioned. So from that experience in the early six, in the first six months, UNDP then began to look at what we call Offer 2.0. And here, to build back better and build forward better, we recognize that a recovery strategy for any country has to be green. So we need to be looking at our whole uh, 
carbon footprint, we look at uh, renewable energy, and to use the opportunity that we have now as countries to actually not go back to the status quo as was before. The world has a great opportunity to invest in, uh, uh, in technologies that uh, actually are not going to be polluting and, and increasing our, 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 our carbon footprint. Uh, but looking at um, the, the nature-based solutions as well, and we see here in Kenya the 10% tree cover and the president's uh, legacy of planting uh, 1.8 billion trees before next year as a tremendous opportunity of uh, building forward better and greener. So green recovery for us is a, a critical component of that. We also see um, governance as a key area of uh, intervention. We're seeing now that um, um, businesses, governments have had to shift into uh, different ways of working because of COVID-19. None of us were able to come to our offices. Uh, and so how do you administer your functions as a sitting government differently? How do you introduce technology in how you deliver services to your people. So the whole foundation of governance and how we've recognized it is undergoing a significant transformation. And for us, this is another one of the opportunities for us to, uh, to, to, to take up. We've supported the great COVID-19 uh, innovation challenge, uh, the disability challenge, and all of those created um, uh, pipelines for investments in new and innovative ways of addressing traditional problems. So we, are, we see innovation and digital as another foundation for building forward better. You can um, adapt information um, uh, to different groups. Uh, it could be uh, read out to people with, um, uh, who, who cannot see can, or have difficulties to see or in read, can, can listen to it. You can adapt the language, so you um, have easy to understand texts. You can um, um, have sign language uh, traduction uh, through um, apps, etc. Um, so there are, there are many ways and also possibilities for people to actually participate in meetings while not being even physically present because they might have difficulties to move to another to another location. As UNDP, we are leveraging our SDG integrator role within the UN family um, to try and connect, um, like I said, you know, different agencies um, under the umbrella of specifically youth entrepreneurship and innovation. So um, examples of this are um, in 2020, we partnered with UNICEF on the Generation Unlimited Youth Challenge, um, where we worked with local innovators, um, to, to scout solutions and to be able to support them um, technically and financially. Um, and they were able to go to the global stage where actually one of the winners globally was a Kenyan group called um, Green Project Initiative from Madare, who are working in the renewable energy space. Um, another example is in partnership with UNESCO. We had the code hack training um, where we worked with 100 um, young girls and women to train them on digital skills and mobile app development. Um, again, just to stimulate that um, creativity and innovation. So we're trying to see how can we fit into the national architecture as well, um, which of course, you know, the government is the biggest driver of, of change. So how do we then connect, connect with that? Um, and through, through different opportunities. So for example, um, I, again, in 2020, we had the great COVID-19 innovation challenge, which followed up with an acceleration program. So this was in partnership with Konza Technopolis, um, as well as other development partners, where we were looking for solutions within the food systems, health systems, and decent work. Um, uh, bearing in mind like how things are shifting in terms of COVID-19. So trying to see how can we, um, how can we, you know, build on this on these learnings and, and then possibly embed them. Like I said, it's not just about scaling single solutions, but rather uh, harnessing those insights and seeing how we can embed them within the strategies um, as we are looking ahead. The digital economy strategy is actually based on five key pillars. One of them is digital infrastructure. By digital infrastructure, we are actually talking about extending 
uh, uh, ICT infrastructure across the entire country. So far we have built 7,000 kilometers of fiber cables connecting almost the entire country and within this particular year we have a plan of extending that by 2,500 kilometers to now move from the county level to the sub-county levels. Another area that is really very critical is what we are calling the development of digital skills. Digital skills, we are talking about having institutions that focuses on the next generation kind of work, that we move from the traditional uh, uh, manual uh, kind of labor, that we move towards more digital enabled uh, works. And this will require development of the requisite, requisite skills for that particular area. Digital innovation and entrepreneurship, again, we continue. The, that's another third pillar. Uh, we continue to spearhead a lot of innovation challenges and we work very closely with the universities, research institutions and other institutions of learning, higher learning, to continue creating an innovation ecosystem that will continue to encourage more and more innovation. And that's why if we even look at innovation index, as a country we are not doing very badly, I don't have the latest statistics. The last time I checked we were actually number three in terms of the innovation within uh, Africa. So basically empowering that.